singing there I'm reminded of a wonderful song that teaches us about the sovereignty and the providence of God uh, his plan has been worked out from the very beginning and I mean before the world even came into being God knew how it was all going to work out and he did it in his perfect time I want to invite the kids to come forward here for just a minute and we're going to share a minute here Y'all having a good week? Everybody having a good week so far? Good, all right. Let's share that treat there. Get you a little something new. Uh, if y'all enjoying this pretty spring weather, it's not making you sneeze or cough or anything like that, is it? It is me. Seasonal allergy sufferers, I'm right there with you. You know the struggle here, okay? can be rough at times so if I take a sneezing fit in the middle of this y'all just look over it just laugh okay now we're going to talk in church today 
and over the next couple of weeks about some things that we do that damage our relationship with God. Big word we call compromise, you know. And what I want you to think about today in, in church, we're going to talk about a guy named Lot. Do you know who Lot was? Lot was a guy, he was Abraham's nephew. And he lived in a town called Sodom. And Lot was a good person, okay? He was a, he was a good person. Lot didn't do bad things. In fact, the Bible even tells us that Lot was faithful to God himself. But Lot would compromise to the culture. And when the angels came to destroy the city of Sodom, and Lot tried to tell people what was going to happen. Nobody would listen to him. They didn't take what he had to say seriously. You know why? Because even though Lot said he loved God, he lived just like the people around him. And that is a word of warning for you and me. See, we're supposed to tell people about our love for Jesus. But, you know, if we don't live markedly differently from everybody else, if they don't see Jesus making a difference in our life, they won't listen to what we have to say. They'll wonder, well, why do I need that, you know? He's just as bad as I am. He's just as, as you know, as uh, there's no difference in him than me. I don't need that. So we have to be very careful how we live, what we say, what, how we act when we're out in front of our other people. Not because we want, they want, we want them to think we're so good, but because we want them to know about the love of Jesus and we want them to hear about him. So be careful how you act with your friends, okay? And always act in the love of Jesus as, as you know, every opportunity so people will listen to what we have to say about him. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, Lord, come before you and admit there are times that, Lord, we just don't do what we're supposed to do. And Father, we ask you to forgive us for the things that we do that keep people from hearing about Jesus. And so, Lord, just help us to be lights for you. Father, to live a life that would draw people to you and not a life that would, you know, drive them away. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you guys are going back to your folks here today. Thank you for being so good. Now, I wasn't lying when I was telling you kids about the allergies, okay? If a sneezing show starts up here, y'all just overlook it, all right? The... Uh, it is beautiful. We sang that song, you know, the Lily of the Valley. This wonderful springtime hymn about the lilies, and it reminds us that the flowers are in bloom and the pollen's out there. All right? What a blessing. But it is beautiful weather. It's a beautiful time of the year. It reminds us of the goodness of the Lord and new life springing forth and all that. And so we are here and we are blessed, even if we have to put up with a little sneezing and coughing for a little while. We'll take it to get all the beauty that the Lord sends our way. In Genesis chapter 19, we're going to find uh, the story of Lot, and we're going to look at just a little piece of it and then kind of put some things together here. In Genesis 19, starting in verse 15, it says, When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought him outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness which you have shown me by saving my life, but I cannot escape to the mountain, for disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there, is it not small, that my life may be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry and escape there, for I cannot do anything till you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. Well, today and over the next uh, month, we are going to talk about a thing that gets in our way 
of making an impact in our society. And if you are a note taker, I'm going to give you three words that you can write down and you hold on to those three words while we're doing this short series. And those words are calm, pro, mize. There you go, all right? Compromise. It's actually just one word. See, I tricked you there. Compromise. Compromise shows up in a lot of different ways. We compromise with the world. We compromise in our faith. We compromise in our daily lives. And you know, here's the thing. Compromise is often necessary. It's a procedure that it's necessary when we're dealing with other people. Now, before we, like, you know, get in a, let's just talk. You can't get by in daily life without some types of compromise. If you are a married couple, or you, you know this is to be the truth, if you live in a house with other people, you know that you have to compromise from time to time just to keep the peace. You know, not everyone has the same taste. Not everyone likes the same food. Not everyone enjoys the same things. And to maintain healthy relationships, we have to give and take a little bit and appreciate the other person. Sometimes when I've been doing uh, marriage counseling for couples looking to get married, you know, I put it this way to them. I was like, look, if you're going to have a healthy marriage, guys, you're just going to have to compromise at times. You know, you're going to have to give up some things. And this is the way compromise works. Down the road, you guys are going to need a new car. And you, Mr. Husband-to-be, you're going to want that nice, fancy, four-wheel drive truck with all the bells and the trimmings and all that stuff. And, and she is going to want that nice minivan so you can haul the kids and get the things that need for the house. And so what y'all are going to do is compromise and get the minivan. So, true compromise doesn't work that way. All right? Everybody has to give something, and everybody gets up a little bit. But... We have a saying, you know, sometimes we'll say we have to pick our battles. That reflects the reality of the compromise situations. That we need. You have to pick your battles. Am I willing to fight over this one? Do I want this thing enough to wreck a relationship or, you know, whatever it takes or to, you know, threaten my, you know, you pick your battles. And compromise is okay in many facets of everyday life. Marriage, like I said, often requires compromises. But there comes a point where compromise cannot be a factor. At some point, there comes a line in the sand that we have to draw that line and we say, we will not compromise on this thing. You may have some core principles that you would never let go of. You would never compromise of. And I hope and I pray that the gospel is one of those major points because the gospel is something where we cannot compromise. We cannot accommodate many of the things of the world you know, because for the sake of the gospel, we have to hold the truth out there. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And today, I titled this message, Compromise and Negate Your Testimony. Compromise or lose your testimony. Because oftentimes when we compromise with the world, it causes us, like I told the kids, to lose our testimony and make it where the world does not want to hear what we have to say. So we're going to talk about that today, looking in the life of Lot, in this instance in the life of Lot. We're going to go over a few, ver you know, cover a good bit of ground here and talk about how Lot compromised and lost his testimony before the people in his life. And the first thing you have noticed is that Lot did when we talk about compromising and why it's so dangerous. You know, the reason Lot compromised his testimony to begin with, Lot compromised his principles and testimony for the sake of prosperity he wanted to have it a good life let's turn in your bible back to chapter 13 okay let's go a few verses back in genesis and in verse 8 of chapter 13 we read where it says so abram said to lot please let there be no strife between you and me or between my herdsmen and your herdsmen for we are brothers is not the whole land before you Please separate from me, if to the left, and I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord, 
like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in, settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were exceeding wickedly, wickedly exceedingly, and sinners against the Lord. See, this, the, the story of Lot begins, we pick up with him as he's living with his uncle Abraham. You know the story of Abraham. Abraham was called to leave his homeland and his family and to travel to a land that God would show him, that land we would call Canaan now. And when Abraham traveled, he took his nephew Lot with him. Abraham did, Abram didn't have any children himself, and Lot's father, Abram's brother, had died. And so basically Lot at that time was sort of like Abram's adopted son, and maybe, probably in Abram's mind, he was going to be his heir because he had no children. He was getting on in age, so was Sarah. And so there's maybe the idea in his mind that his nephew, Lot, then, would become his heir and take things over. And so for a while, they traveled together. But at some point, they got to this point to where Abram was wealthy and had lots of flocks and herds, and Lot had a lot of flocks and herds and was pretty well off in his own right. And look, the southern part of the Judean countryside is not a very... Uh, verdant country it's not very green there's not a lot of land to support a lot of grazing it's a lot of desert not a lot of water and so they began to fight over the resources that were there and so they came up with this thing and abram said look we, we we've both gotten too big we can't stay in this thing together we're going to have to separate so that we don't go to war with each other and you, you choose which way you will go and i'll go the other and lots drift into compromise began when he separated from his faithful uncle Abram. Now, Abram wasn't perfect. You read his story, you'll find times when he compromised as well. But the difference in the two was that Abram was willing to let God correct him and to back up from those compromises he had made and to let God correct what was going on in his life. Lot was blind to that and never saw that. And Lot's drift began when he separated from his faithful uncle and he moved down into the valley of the Jordan as we said that in that time it, it was well watered and green unlike the desert country there in the Judean wilderness and even down to Sodom and Gomorrah down around what we would call the Dead Sea today everything was prosperous and everything was good and Lot looked down there and he that's where I want to go all right Uncle Abram you're giving me the choice you can have that desert over there I'll take the, the well water one over here. And what Lot didn't know, but what Abram found out, was God was in the wilderness. God was in the rough places. Lot separated and went to the easy, prosperous places. And he missed out on what God had. And his drift began when he separated from his uncle Abram. Now Lot, all that Lot gained, and, and Lot went there because here Sodom was a rich and prosperous town, and Lot was a guy who was on his way up, and he was getting rich and prosperous himself, and he wanted to be part of the prosperity that he saw down in the Jordan Valley. And so he was willing to move down there with those wicked uh, townspeople and live among them and be part of them just for the sake of prosperity. But, you know, all that he gained, and he was wealthy, and he was respected, and he was... Uh, at a high position in Sodom. He was prosperous for a while. But everything he gained, everything that Lot gained, he lost. And instead of being a wealthy man with lots of flocks and herds, he lost all of that in the destruction of Sodom. You know what he wound up being? He wound up being a caveman. You look at verse 30, uh, where it says, Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him. For he was afraid to stay in Zoar, so he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Lot compromised and lost his testimony for the sake of prosperity and wealth and the good life. And he wound up losing both. He lost his testimony and he lost the good life he was seeking after. And he wound up, ended up his days living as a caveman out in the wilderness that's a sad story y'all 
That's a sad story. But don't we do the same thing today? Don't we compromise our testimony for the sake of prosperity? Don't we decide that there are times when we need to keep our mouth shut and not rock the boat, you know, so we don't cause problems at work or so that we can get along with our supervisor or so that we can be in line for the next promotion or so that we might get this or get that? It happens. But listen, Lot found out, and we will ultimately find out, that the wealth of this world can be gone in a second. Gone in a second. But your testimony is eternal. That's what you have to hang on to. That's what you can't compromise on. Your testimony, your word for God and his will is eternal. Everything that we decide we want in this world is temporary. There is a, an eye-opening passage in Proverbs chapter 23. It says, When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. That's strong words, isn't it? Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle toward heaven. Oh, man, that is a, that is a hard-hitting passage right there. I'm going to share you just a personal word that, and I've shared with some folks here that, about this very passage. There was a time in my life where I was offered a job that was a good job. And I took it and I was asked, you know, hey, how, what, kind of, what are you looking to make in this job? And I'm like, oh, man, I want to make X amount of money here, more money than I'd ever made in any other job. And the person that offered me that job looked right at me and said, oh, you're thinking too low. Opportunity is there for you to make a lot more money than that in this job. And I want you to make that kind of money, and I want you to live high on the hog. I want you to get the, your wife to get that big dream house that you've always had, and then I've got you. And he was right, and I saw it happen. In many instances, I saw men at work who would work there, who would do things that you could tell went against their grain because they had bought into this lifestyle that now they can't afford to let it go. And it wasn't long after that that I was sitting there reading my Bible and I came across this passage. See, nothing happens by accident. God put it there for a purpose. And it, it was eye-opening. And it made me determine, I said, you know what? No matter what happens, I'm not going to change my lifestyle. I'm living and getting by and eating like I am right now. We're going to live this lifestyle. You know, if the Lord blesses us with extra, we'll, you know, be able to give, we'll be able to save, whatever. But this idea that the world's wealth can drag you down is true. And if you are a Christian, you are a child of God. It does not just drag you down. It drags your testimony down and your word for God. And we are called to be priests in this world. And so Lot compromised his testimony and lost his testimony, first of all, for the sake of prosperity. You know, he compromised his principles and his testimony for another thing as well, not just prosperity. And these kind of things sort of go together. He compromised for the sake of position. Look at verse 1 in chapter 19. It says, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Now the cry of Sodom had come up. Sodom was an unrighteous town. We could go on and on about all the things that were wrong in Sodom. That's a subject for another day. But the cry had come up and God had decided he was going to put an end to Sodom. He was just going to destroy that place. He's going to rain fire down upon it. And so he had come along one day, he and these two angels, and they had stopped by Abraham's tents. And they'd had dinner with Abraham, and God told Abraham what he was going to do. And you have this story, well, you can read the story yourself in the preceding verses and chapters, what we just read. Uh, Abraham bargained with God and tried to negotiate him down. You know, I said, what if you find 50 righteous? Will you, what if you find 40? What if you find 10? And, you know, God kept saying, okay, if I find 50, I won't destroy them. If I find 10, I won't destroy them. Because God knew he wasn't going to find 10 in that whole town. 
it was thoroughly rotten to the core. But this is where this is where Lot lived. And this is where Lot prospered. And this is where Lot moved into local leadership in the political scene of the land of Sodom. Lot had moved down, as it said, he moved into the, uh, we just read it, he moved into the Jordan Valley, and then it said he's moved his tents as far as Sodom. He kept moving closer and closer and closer to the big city and the money and all that was going on down there. And as Lot became involved with the trade and the prosperity of the town, of course, he began to gain a reputation himself. And here Lot was, a fairly wealthy man too. And so we find him there in verse 1, sitting in the gates, it said. Now, what this means to us, he, he's not just sitting there watching the traffic go by. You know, that's, that's not what he's doing. He's not just loafing in the gates. Back in the old days, you had these, the cities, the towns. They were fortified towns. You built a, a big city. You built walls around it so that you could be defended. If the enemy came, you'd have, of course, flocks and farmlands and stuff around. But in times of trouble or times of warfare, everyone would retreat to the city and inside the walls. And these uh, walls were thicker a lot of times than we realize, and they were deep. And when you went in a gate, you didn't often just go straight into the town. You might have to go through some chicanes you know and this was done to keep the enemy from being able to get straight through but it was in the gates where you would have some rooms set up and some seats set up and this is where the elders of the town would sit and this is where the political business of the and judicial business of the town was done so if you came and you had to you know to, to sue somebody you had a lawsuit against someone or a complaint against someone you went to the gate because the elders or some of the elders or whoever was on duty of the elders that day would be sitting in the gate to judge your case or to make decisions for the good of the town. Look here, Lot is sitting in the gate. He is one of the leaders of the town. He has risen politically to a high position in the town. And so at this point, it looks like life is good. Lot is wealthy. Lot is rich. Lot has influence in the town. He has a high position. But it's all about to come crashing down. See, sitting in the gate, we assume that Lot was a leader of the city. Someone people would look to. Someone people would follow. But we find that Lot was not a true leader at all. Because he compromised his testimony, the people closest to him did not place any weight on the things that he had to say. He lost the ability to lead those who were closest to him. Look at verse 26. It says, His wife from behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Lot lived with this woman. He had children with this woman. Day to day, they were together. They ate and they talked like husbands and wives do. And yet, she didn't see enough in Lot's testimony to want what Lot had. She still wanted what Sodom had to offer. And so, they were commanded to leave the city and not look back, but she couldn't help herself. She didn't want to leave. She kept looking back. Lot didn't have enough influence to save his wife. Not only that, if you look over in, in uh, verse 31, it says, I'm telling you the wrong thing. Verse 12, it says, The two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here, a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of this place? We're about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters. He said, up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. He didn't take him seriously. No. His sons-in-laws didn't listen to him. They didn't take him seriously. Over here in verse 31. Lot's daughter 
The firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man on earth to come into us after the banner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him that we may preserve our family through our father. Such a sad state of affairs. That Lot, Lot who was supposedly a high leader in his community, couldn't even lead his family into the ways of righteousness. He had a wife that didn't want to turn loose of the things of this world. He had two daughters that evidently didn't know right from wrong enough to where they decided that the way that they needed to uh, confirm their future was to get their father drunk and have relations with him and have incestual relations and have children that way. He had two sons-in-law who were going to marry these two girls. So he went and told them, we got to get out of here. Judgment is coming. The Lord is coming. And they said, ah, that's a good one, Lot. You've, have you told that before? Why, when he came with this terrible message, wouldn't they listen? Because he, he didn't have a testimony to begin with. He had thrown it away. They hadn't seen him. He hadn't been talking about the Lord. He hadn't been doing this stuff. And so it just seemed like all fun and games. And nobody would listen to Lot when push came to shove. Shows you how his testimony was degraded. And our testimony is far more important than anything we could ever gain in this world. When you go out of this world, you are not going to take one penny, one farthing, one article of clothing, not one sock with a hole in the toe with you when you go. Okay? But your testimony is going to live on in your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, the people who have been around you in your life. And it'll pass on, even though we don't realize it, from generation to generation. We can't throw that away. That's true leadership. It doesn't matter if you rise to the office of the presidency, the highest office in the land. That's going to pass away. What are we going to leave behind us? And that's our testimony. That's why in Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And what can a man give in return for his soul? The world's passing away. The gospel is forever. Don't throw that away for these things that are going to pass. Hold that world's wealth loosely so that people will take seriously your love and your message of the gospel. And so here Lot, who went out with a good message, with a true message, the Lord is going to destroy the city. Judgment is coming. The problem was he hadn't been a faithful witness up to that point. And so no one took seriously what he had to say at that point. He wasn't a true leader at all, like he thought he was. And Lot compromised his principles and his testimony for the sake of prosperity. He compromised for the sake of position. And because he compromised, he caused his testimony to lose its purpose. Look at verse 12. The two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here, a son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of this place? We're about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord sent us to destroy it. Lot went out, spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Lot was sent to lead his family into deliverance, but his testimony had no weight with the people closest to him. You know that we always say, the people closest to you, the ones that know you the best, right? They're the ones that know you the best. And his testimony had no weight with those people. See, Lot's purpose for going into town was to preach a message of judgment and deliverance, to bring those out, those people who were closest to him. But because of his compromise, his testimony couldn't accomplish its purpose. His word couldn't accomplish its purpose. And the people who heard him placed no weight on what he had to say. This wasn't what Lot had been saying from day to day. This wasn't what reflected Lot's daily activities. All of a sudden now he's talking this religious stuff. Man, 
This Lot, he sits in the gate. He's one of the Sodom elders. You know, he's rich. He's like the rest of the guys. Lot's sad legacy is Moab and Ammon. That's Lot's testimony. That's Lot's sad legacy. Over in verse 36. You can read where it says, Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son, called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Moabites and the Ammonites. That's Lot's, Lot's legacy. You know who the Moabites and the Ammonites are? They, they lived across the Jordan River on the east side of the Jordan River from the, uh, where the Israelites would live. They are genetically related to the Israelites. They are the same people, the same stock, the same family, and they were always bitter enemies of the people of God. The Ammonites and the Moabites were bitter enemies of the Israelites. That's Lot's legacy. That's Lot's testimony. That's what he left. Never lose sight of God's redemptive purpose for your testimony. Never lose sight of God's redemptive purpose for your testimony. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them or be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, that if, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. There's a purpose for your testimony. There's a purpose for your word. It is to let your light shine in this world, to draw people to this Jesus who died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we might be redeemed. And we for sure don't want to tarnish that word in any way that people just say, I don't know what, I don't want what she's selling. I don't want what he's selling because I know it. Now, it's one thing if you witness to somebody and they say, I don't want what you're selling because I've heard this before and I don't buy that. You don't know them. You know, that's one thing. But when somebody won't accept your testimony because they know you and you are the reason they won't accept the testimony, that's convincing. That's convicting. Don't throw your testimony away. Don't let it lose its purpose. You are placed where you are in your home in your workplace, in your school, in your social activities. You are there for a purpose. And that purpose is to shine the light of the gospel. Don't lose that purpose for the sake of prosperity, for the sake of a position, you know. I want that next promotion. I want to be rich. I want to have as good a car as my neighbor, all those kind of things. Look, there's nothing wrong with having the position. There's nothing wrong with having nice clothes and a fancy car. But there's everything wrong with compromising your testimony to get it. Okay? Now, here's the sad part of this story to me. And that is that Lot himself was not an evil person. Lot was not a bad person. Lot was a guy who, if he was here with us, he would be right here on this pew every Sunday, regular attender in this church. Maybe even throwing some amens in there for some of the stuff. In 2 Peter, Peter would write in chapter 2, If he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Lot lived in Sodom, and, and you know, Lot himself was not a, a wicked person. And he was tormented, and he didn't agree with what he saw going on around him, but you know what? He was willing to live with it. At any time, Lot could have picked up his tents and moved away from Sodom and said, we just can't be here. You know, this, this is destroying my testimony. We've got to go. At any time, Lot could have spoken up 
but he didn't. That's why he was tormented, y'all. That's why he was tormented. He realized he was getting sucked into that vortex of the world, the wicked world that he saw around him. And it bothered him, but apparently it didn't bother him enough to get out of there. And that's the sad part of Lot's story to me, that he himself was personally righteous. And he was rescued from the destruction that was coming, but he wasn't able to take the people that meant the most to him with him because he allowed himself to be so compromised nobody would listen to his word when the time came. Lot was a person who let the culture influence him more than he influenced the culture. And no one, no one in Lot's circle or Lot's family looked to God because of Lot's life or testimony. Lot did, it's true, but no one else did because of Lot's testimony. So, don't negate God's purpose for the gospel you are called to share with your friends, your family, your work. Don't negate that by your words. Don't negate that by your life. Don't negate that by your behavior. Understand that wherever you are, you are on God's errand. You are here as Christ's representative. You are here to share the gospel, not just to get ahead. If God lets you get ahead while you're doing it, hallelujah, praise the Lord. There are a lot of rich people in the Bible. Abraham was rich. David was rich. And we call them heroes of the faith, you know. But don't let the idea that you need to have that compromise your testimony. Hold out for God. There are some things we have to draw the line on. And if it costs us a job, if it costs us a relationship, if it costs us our good name in the community, we are going to hold firm to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never compromise and lose your testimony. All right? I'm going to ask Jeremy to come up here and our musicians. And we're going to sing some a hymn of invitation, a hymn of response. And if at this time the Lord is speaking to your heart that you would like to uh, come forward and make a public statement of faith, we want to invite you to come forward and do that. Now at this time, maybe for the first time, to ask, say, I've asked Jesus into my heart. I want these people, I want you to know this. And I want you to pray for me and be my brothers and sisters in Christ and help me get along. Maybe you've Come to a point in your life and you realize, you know, I've been following Lot's path more than, you know, God's path. Everybody gets off the right path at times. You need to repent and ask God to help you restore what's been lost. He'll do it. He'll do it. But you have to commit to it. Come forward and say, I'm recommitting my life. If you got a prayer concern, we'll be honored to pray with you over something that's burdening your heart. And if you want to bring a concern to the altar privately, we encourage that as well. Just kind of just go to the side benches. We look at that and say, okay, this is private, and we won't pry, but we'll keep you lifted up in prayer while you're there. You can share when you're ready. Let's all stand. And come. Thank you for being here with us this morning, Macedonia Baptist Church. We understand that folks may have questions, and it can be difficult to respond if you're watching us in the digital and online format, but we want to give you the opportunity to respond as well, maybe to something that you've heard in this message, or maybe to something that someone has said to you in the days and weeks ahead, something you've heard on the radio, and you just have questions, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you. We want to encourage you to text Ask Me. that's A-S-K-M-E, 77411. If you will do that, someone will be back in touch with you, and we will try to help you as you walk for questions about salvation or about your relationship with God. We will feel honored to help you in that place. We also want to encourage you that uh, you can join us and get updates from us. If, if you're uh, enjoying what you see or it's touching your heart in some way, feel up to date. That's UP, the number two, D A T E, to 77411. That will get you in our loop where you can get updates from the church announcements and things like that we want to thank you for being here again if you have questions feel free to ask me at 77411 and we will work together as you try to walk closer to the lord thank you god bless you and have a wonderful day